In this video we'll be going through the 2019 Waves paper. Alright, satellites exist, dishes do things, blah blah blah. Complete the ray diagram to show how parallel rays are reflected in concave mirrors in general. Well, concave mirrors of course converge rays, as opposed to convex mirrors which diverge rays. So really what it's asking us to show is that we know that concave mirrors converge rays, and furthermore that they converge them to the focal point. So let's do that. Okay. The students realise that in order to use the mirror for the model, they need to know its focal length. They place a 3cm high Lego toy 30cm in front of the mirror, and determine the image to be 2cm high. By determining the distance of the image from the mirror, calculate the focal length. Well, first up, let's write what we're given. OK, so to find the focal length, we're going to need to use Descartes' equation, which looks like this. Where we know the DO, but we don't know the DI. So we're going to have to find the DI. To find the DI, we can use the magnification equation, which tells us this. And that's given to you on your formula sheet. Rearranging that for di, we just multiply both sides by do. Putting in our numbers gives us 20 centimeters. Shouldn't be any need to reach for a calculator for that one. Now over at Descartes' equation, we of course now need to solve this for the focal length which we can do rather easily by just flipping each side. Putting in our numbers. And that gives me exactly 12. OK. Draw two rays from the Lego toy to locate the position of the image. Draw and label the image. OK, so there are three rays we can draw, and I'll do my best on this tablet, but no promises for straight lines. The first is parallel to the axis, and then through the focal length. The second is through the focal length and parallel to the axis. And the third is reflected symmetrically through the mirror. Our image is therefore right here. And don't forget to label that image. OK, what would be the effect on the position of the image of increasing the radius of curvature of the mirror? Explain your answer. So increasing the curvature of the mirror will increase the focal length. This will essentially be the same thing as moving the object towards the mirror. The effect will be that the image will become larger, and it will also be further away from the mirror. So let's put that into words. Increasing the radius of curvature increases the focal length. This will make the image larger and increase its distance. OK. The student replaces the mirror with a concave lens. They place a Lego toy in front of the lens as below. Complete the ray diagram to show the image produced and describe the nature of the image formed. OK, so for this one we can draw two different rays, though once again because I'm on a tablet the straightness of the lines might be somewhat in question. The first one is parallel to the axis and then away from the focal point. And the second one is right through the middle. And if we were to 
CME indicate that there is a dotted line coming back as well. And so the location of the image, it's going to be quite hard to draw, is right there. So we can see that the image is diminished, it is virtual, and it is also upright. Now, as a quick aside, the reason the image is virtual is because the rays, these rays, they don't actually converge. They don't converge in real space. In order for us to imagine they converge, we have to draw these virtual rays going back. So when the rays aren't actually converging, when we're having to imagine these virtual rays, we have a virtual image. Okay, on to question two. Fiber optic cables exist and do things, blah, blah, blah. The diagram shows infrared waves traveling from air into the core. Calculate angle two if angle one is 36 degrees. Okay, so right off the bat, they're trying to trap you. So they've done this thing that they always love to do. They've given you the angle that you don't need. So 36 degrees is not the angle of incidence. This one here is. So to find that, you need to go 90 minus 36, which means that this one is 54 degrees. And that's the one you want to use. To find our angle 2, we're going to need to use Snell's Law. Where our N1 is our refractive index of air, which is 1, our N2 is of course 1.45, our refractive index of the core. Our angle 1, ignore this, our angle 1 is 54. And our angle 2 is the thing we want to find. So we need to solve this Snell's law for theta 2. The first thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by n2, and I'll swap the sides around as well. Next, I'm going to take the inverse sine of both sides, which will get rid of this sine and leave me with the angle that I want to solve for. Putting in our numbers. Gives me 33.9, and because the question has given us two significant figures as a minimum, so here it's given us two significant figures, I'm going to round that to 34 degrees. Okay. Name and explain the physics phenomenon that occurs at the air core boundary, which is basically a way of saying give us the textbook definition of refraction. The phenomenon is refraction. When the ray enters the core, it slows down and bends toward the normal. Mathematically, the velocity goes down, the wavelength goes up, and the frequency remains the same. This answer might somewhat be overkill, but it's always good to cover all the bases. Okay. As the beam moves through the optical fiber, it is continually rebounding off the walls of the core as shown below. For this to occur, the cladding must have a lower refractive index than the core. Name the phenomenon that allows this process and give a comprehensive explanation why it is important that the cladding has a lower refractive index than the core. Alright, this is almost a carbon copy of the format of the previous question, where it now wants us to talk about total internal reflection. Total internal reflection. As the ray enters the cladding, it bends away from the normal. N must be lower for this to occur. If the incident angle is greater than the critical angle, the ray will totally internally reflect back into the core. Okay.
The infrared waves have a frequency of 3.53 times 10 to the 4. The speed of light in air is that. The refractive index of the core is 1.45. By first determining the wavelength of the incident ray in air, calculate the wavelength of the ray once it has entered the core. So let's first write down what we have. Now they don't explicitly give us the refractive index of air, but given that the velocity is 3 times 10 to the power of 8, we can infer that it is, of course, 1. OK, first of all, let's find lambda 1. And we can use that using the relationship V1 equals F lambda 1, rearranging that for lambda 1, putting in our numbers, gives me 8.498, and since the question has given us three significant figures across the board, we'll round this to three significant figures, which gives us 8.50 times 10 to the negative 7. And I forgot a tiny one there. OK, now looking at your formula sheet, we have this relationship here. Which is very handy because we know both of these refractive indices. And we also know our lambda 1. What we're trying to find is our lambda 2, our wavelength in the core. So we can just solve this by multiplying both sides by lambda 1. Putting in our numbers, gives me 5.86 times 10 to the minus 7. And don't forget your units. OK. Question 3. Mountainous regions make radio communication and signal reception particularly difficult. Blah, blah, blah. Transmitter strategically placed. Fred lives in a house between two hills as shown. And he listens to FM radio stations. Question A asks us if a radio transmitter uses a frequency of 95 megahertz. Show that the time period for the waves is 10.5 nanoseconds. And so a key to this question is to know that mega of course means million which is times 10 to the power of 6. The equation to convert from frequency to period is particularly simple. Period is equal to 1 over frequency. They are reciprocals of each other. So if we just put in our number which gives me 1.05 times 10 to the 8, the minus 8 rather. And because a nanosecond is times 10 to the minus 9, that is equivalently written as 10.5 nanoseconds which is fortunate because that's exactly what we're trying to show. OK. Describe the phenomenon that allows the transmission to be received at Fred's house, despite the transmission tower being out of sight of his house. Include a diagram in your discussion and explain whether or not longer wavelengths would make reception of signals better for his house shown. So let's have another look at this diagram. OK. All right. Oh, that's fortunate. They've drawn the transmitter and the house for us. So, of course, the phenomenon that it's wanting us to discuss is called diffraction. And so the waves are going to bend around this hill um, towards Fred's house, allowing him to pick up the signals. And the key thing about diffraction, which it's wanting us to identify, is that the longer the wavelength is, the more the wave will diffract. So let's first try to draw a wave diffracting. 
and that's probably as good as it's going to get. So let's try and put this into words. The radio waves are able to diffract around the hill due to their long wavelength, compared with visible light. The longer the wavelength, the more a wave diffracts, thus longer wavelengths would help. OK. A second transmitter broadcasting on the same frequency is built next to the opposite mountain to boost the signal. A test pulse is sent from each tower. And we have a nice little diagram here. One grid square per second for each of them in opposite directions. And we're asked to draw the resulting superposition after three seconds. OK. So to work this out, I'm going to look at each of these pulses and figure out where their amplitudes are after three seconds. So if I look at this as two columns of three, and this is three columns of four, after three seconds, that's where our threes are going to be, since they've moved three squares in our rightwards direction, and our fours are going to be here. Now if we then add our amplitudes together, what we're going to end up with is this column with three in it, this column with seven, and these two columns with four. So let's draw that. OK. When a second transmitter transmitting at the same frequency is added, explain with reference to wave interference why some locations in the valley may receive a boosted signal while other locations may not. So this question is basically wanting us to define and talk about 2D wave interference patterns. So we'll need to just explain that that's what's occurring. We'll need to talk about nodal and antinodal lines. We'll need to talk about constructive and destructive interference, and then link that to troughs meeting troughs, peaks meeting peaks, and peaks meeting troughs, and cancellation, and so on and so forth. So this is going to be a nice long explanation. The two transmitters will create an interference pattern. Low signal areas are where peaks meet troughs, destructive interference occurs, waves are 180 degrees out of phase, and the path difference is a number 0.5 wavelengths. High signal areas are where peaks meet peaks, trough meet troughs, there is constructive interference occurring, waves are in phase, and the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths. And that's it.